started. Thanks for those of you that are joining online as well this morning. Um, let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer this morning. Dear God, we just uh, come before you right now, and God, I pray that you would just continue to use us uh, for your glory. Lord, I pray that today would be a day where the power of your Spirit speaks to every single one of us, no matter where we're at in our walk with you, whether we're close to you or far from you right now. God, I pray that today's message would just inspire and motivate others to glorify your name and realize what you're doing in their life. And God, we just submit this message to you and everything that's said here on stage this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm excited to be able to close out this series on Eat Your Peas because uh, in a moment you're going to be able to find out I get a little passionate, all right? So if, if that offends you, uh, I'm just going to say sorry right off the beginning because I'll probably offend you, all right? Because I get excited when I think about reading the Scriptures and the Old Testament. And unfortunately, when we think about reading the Old Testament, I don't know about what you think about, what, when you hear eat your peas, I actually like peas, but I think the phrase eat your spinach, because my mom and dad used to make me eat spinach, and uh, I didn't like it, and the only way they got me to eat it is they used to tell me I'd be like Popeye, and, and it didn't work, and so, but they got me to eat spinach that way, but eat your peas means something different to all of us, but it really reflects that, that thing that we don't, we never found the intrinsic value of when we were younger, and we were forced to do something that we didn't really enjoy. And so sometimes, and unfortunately, many of us as Christians, we look at reading the Old Testament the same way. Sometimes we even look at reading the New Testament the same way. And, and it's unfortunate because sometimes I hear things like, well, the, the Bible doesn't really apply to me, or I don't really understand it, or it's just an archaic ancient text, or it's not really applicable. Or the one that really gets me is, is when people talk about the Old Testament, especially Christians, and they're like, well, I don't really like reading the Old Testament because it doesn't really make God look very good. Huh, really? So now we're the judge of God and his holy word and what, and we get to be the author of that? I, it just cracks me up that we think that somehow or another we have a better reflection of God than his own word. Like he wrote this. This is his letter to us. And so I really encourage you guys, when you think about this, this series, take the tools that we've given you because we don't, I don't have time to go back and read everything and, and reiterate everything that Matt and Zach have talked about. Zach kicked off this series um, talking about I'm going to get it this time. Gomer and Hosea. All right, I said Homer and Hosea, or I don't even know what I said. But anyways, Gomer and Hosea, uh, phenomenal message. If you weren't here, you've got to go back and listen to it. And Matt talked last week about the, the battle of Jericho and made that come alive to us and how the walls in our own lives need to tear down. Um, but what has been consistent are the four tools that we want you to be able to take with you when you exit these doors. Because the Word of God, there is no way, even, even if you came to church every Sunday, which... That doesn't really happen all that much. But anyways, even if you did, um, if you came every single Sunday that we were open and, uh, you, and you heard our messages, there's no way we could even begin to scratch the surface of this. Uh, and I really encourage you, take these tools and read them and apply them to your, for yourself when you do your Bible study. And so the four tools are this um, that we've been talking about in this series is find the style you need to understand the style that the, the author was using to be able to really truly dig into what's the scripture really saying in that moment. You have to understand the context, and that's the contextual history, the, the historicity of, of what was happening in the culture. And man, with Google, we have so much at our fingertips now. All right? So find the context, and then what is the message? What was the author trying to say to their audience of the day? All right? So we have to understand the audience's interpretation, and then from that, then we can extrapolate that and we can apply it to ourselves. All right? And then the last one is credibility. Is there any credible evidence that proves that this is true? And so what you're going to find in a, in a second, is, and I'll get pretty excited here, is context and credibility go together in my world. All right? And so when I start studying the culture and I get excited about the history and, and I dig into that, then that's what proves the credibility in my mind of the words that I'm reading. Okay, and one of the things I want to want to help you understand um, is that this book has more archaeological evidence than any other book in the history of mankind, the history of mankind, and yet we want to question it at times. So just keep that in mind when we go through studying this. So let's dig into Daniel this morning a little bit and find out what his style was. So Daniel's style. Um, was, was, uh, he was a minor prophet, and so I don't know if you know what minor prophet means, but it literally means um, the fact that he wasn't important. No, I'm just joking. All right, it, it, means, it literally means the size of the book, all right? It's really just how big the book was, sometimes the scope of the audience, okay? But it's really just the size. Um, and it was prophetic, all right, because he was a prophet, and so there's, it speaks of doom and, and punishment and coming catastrophes and 
people fall, falling away from God and, and what God's going to do in that. So it's prophetic in that nature, um, and we can historically track a lot of what Daniel talks about. And he uses some crazy symbolism. If you've never read Daniel, um, it's one of the more difficult books to understand. And that's why I chose it, because I want to give you some tools that will hopefully maybe break down some of that complexity. Um, but he wasn't just prophetic, he was apocalyptic. And if you don't know what apocalyptic is, that's really uh, end times theology, uh, eschatology stuff. And so uh, when you start studying Daniel, you'll realize that Revelation and Daniel really go together. And you have to, and if you want to dig into Revelation, you're going to find some correlations with, with Daniel as well and what Jesus said in Matthew and the end times. And they all start coming together. And so a lot of what Daniel talked about still hasn't even happened yet. And so there's, it's not just prophetic of his day, but it's also prophetic of our day and apocalyptic in nature. And then the other part that uh, many people don't realize, and, and I've actually never even heard it preached this way, um, but it's written in two different languages, okay? And this part's fascinating to me because it makes it come alive. Now, I know we're eating our peas, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on a little spoon, and I'm going to go, listen to the helicopter. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to try and break this down for you. I'm just joking. All right, sort of. But anyways, so it's written in two different languages because he had two different audiences. Chapter 1 and chapters 8 through 12 were written to the Hebrew people, okay? Chapter 2 through chapter 7 were written to the common people. Chapter 1 and 8 through 12 were written in Hebrew. Chapter 2 through 7 were written in Aramaic, and everybody would have been able to understand it. So when you read it, Read chapter 1 as though Daniel is reminding you because you were his people. When you read chapter 2 through 7, read it as though you're the people that are going to be judged and you're part of the story. And then 8 through 12, read it as though you're the people that are going to be receiving the promise of the apocalyptic literature that's being displayed. Okay? So if you can break it down and remember that, when you, read these, when you read this passage, it really helps Daniel come alive. Because you're still going to get into some complex uh, teachings, and there's going to be some crazy things. You're going to be like, man, that doesn't make any sense, and that's weird, and it is, but it helps. And that's what we want to do is give you tools to be able to better help your study habits. All right? So if that wasn't enough to get you going and excited about history, then, uh, then maybe this will. Um, what we, what we know about Daniel, um, not only just from a literary standpoint, but also archaeologically, uh, we know how to rebuild the picture of what was going on in society. You see, we have this amazing thing called the Dead Sea Scrolls, phenomenal archaeological find, and it has proved the validity, the credibility of the scriptures that we find in the book of Daniel. Okay? And so when we, when we have that, it only serves as a, as a resource and a tool to help bolster our faith. So many people tell me, well, I really just don't believe the Bible. Then if you don't believe the Bible, I don't know how you can believe anything. Because the Bible has more factual evidence than any other book in the history of mankind. And so I know that I can stand up here very comfortably as a pastor and preach the Word of God and the, the viable application of the Word of God in your life because I know that His Word is going to be true. Why? Because it has withstood the test of time. And every time we find something archaeological, it only supports the Scriptures. It, there's a lot that hasn't been found, but every time we do find something, it only validates it even more. We are not, I'm not espousing a blind faith here. I'm encouraging you to dig deep into the Word of God and let it come alive with some of these tools. So when we do that, and we start studying the context and the credibility of the book of Daniel, we have to ask ourselves, are there, are there any historical evidences that would help us understand what was going on in Daniel's day and age? And here's the really cool thing. Yes, there are all kinds of evidences that we have. You see, Daniel lived during a time of incredible uh, historical um, importance. I'll just say it that way. Uh, and he lived during the Babylonian captivity, and then he lived so long, he then went over into the Persian captivity. And if you know anything about the Persian captivity, it led up to the Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. And then you're like, well, those books came before Daniel, not only in the Bible, not only in the way that we interpret it, not in the original Hebrew, but those events that happened in those books all happened after Daniel. And so Daniel set them up, and he actually prophesied about them and what was going to happen. And so you have to understand, digging into it, what was going on. And so when we look at the extra-biblical sources, we can rebuild the culture that Daniel was living in. Okay? And so when we, when we read this, this is, all, this is all stuff that's going on outside of reading the Scriptures. Because sometimes when we get bored with something, you know, you read, uh, 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 and Daniel said this, uh, okay, done with my devotions, we close the book. And we miss out. 
We miss out on what Daniel was trying to tell us. We miss out on what God's word is revealing to us because we're just trying to check something off our list. But Daniel, he grew up in a time where King Nebuchadnezzar was the king and the pharaoh. And he grew up in a day and age, and what we know about the Persian and the Babylonian Empire, um, that they, they didn't intermix and they didn't intermarry, and they lived in a time where the kings of the day, if they besieged someone, if they took over something, if they came in and captured you, uh, they would make your nation subservient to you. And what that meant is they were, their God was more powerful than your God. Okay, And so if King Nebuchadnezzar came in, and let's imagine you're all Israelites, and you're all living in Judah, because that's where Daniel takes place. King Nebuchadnezzar comes in, and he, he takes over our nation, but you guys are all just common people, and uh, this group up here are the king's courts. He would have wiped you guys all out, and the rest of you guys, uh, you all made it, but you would have realized, oh, our God's no longer powerful, because his God's more powerful, and then we just, because we don't want to end up like them, because they're dead now, uh, we, want to, we want to go over here, and we want to live, so we just worship their gods. Because in the ancient customs, those pharaohs, they were worshipped as the, the, um, the evidence that they were the physical manifestation of the God of their country, of their, of their people group. And so they would literally bow down and worship that person as, the, as a reflection of the gods of their nation. And so that's really important when we dig into the book of Daniel to understand the culture that was going on at the time. And we have to get rid of this idea. When, and this, is, this happens in our culture a lot because we're Western. Um, we, we forget the fact that it's only in recent history that this idea that no God exists is, is something that's taught. That's never been believed historically. So you cannot read history, you cannot read the Bible as if people were like us. Because they weren't. There was no question as to whether or not there was a God. There was no question that we had to worship someone bigger than us. There was no question about any of that. It's been through the, it's, that's only recent history. And so I challenge you, make sure you get rid of all of the presuppositions of, of your interpretation of God when you study history or the scriptures, because that's really a recent historical teaching. Okay? And so when we study the scriptures and we study Daniel, then we have to ask ourselves, okay, is there any credible evidence that proves that this is how people really believed? Okay, so then uh, we have to ask ourselves or answer the question with yes. All right, how do I know that? Well, I had an opportunity to go up to this place called the University of Chicago up in uh, Michigan when I was a pastor up there. Um, I took a I took our church on a trip and a tour to go see this and. Um, and the University of Chicago is obviously not a Christian university, and so they don't teach this from a biblical standpoint. I hired a, theo a biblical theologian, and he took us on a tour through history uh, in this museum. It's the Oriental Museum of, of, art, of Art. And so you're, this wall, I would stand right around in here as far as the height. And so anyways, this little piece of evidence right here, I believe that one's actually from King Sargon of the Babylonian Empire or maybe Persian Empire. Um, my history there's a little weak, but it's one of the two. So you can look it up, find out which one it is, and correct me. But anyways, it's so big. They pulled that piece of evidence out. They brought it over to America, set it in place, and then built the Oriental Museum around it. Okay, it's phenomenal. And then you're going to see these little walls here, and that goes along with it here in a second to help us understand the culture. And so why is that important? Because all these walls, the paintings, the drawings that we find in these places, the writings, the 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 king's decrees, and all that. It gives us an, a picture of the life that Daniel had to live in, all right? And so it only validates even more what Daniel was saying. There's another picture here. This one was fascinating. When I was going through the tour, it was just amazing. It, got, it made the Old Testament just come alive. It's like, wow, this is amazing. So this picture of the, the lion, all right, Daniel and the lion's then, all right? So this picture of the lion was uh, King Cyrus's courtyard, all right? So they date this back to King Cyrus, uh, which we'll see and hear his name here in a moment. Um, Daniel probably touched that wall. That's so cool. Like 2,400 years ago, Daniel walked in front of this wall. Isn't that cool? Like, I don't, uh, it doesn't excite you guys at all. But anyways, that's okay. Um, it is so fascinating to me. We as Americans, we, we think that this 
world kind of revolves around us a little bit, and we are living in one of the youngest nations in the world, and there's all these historical evidences of, of people that have gone before us, of, of cultures and worlds that exist before us, and we've got to dig into them to understand what did our predecessors know about God and his character when they taught us uh, through the scriptures. And so we have all these things, King Darius, King Cyrus, King Artaxerxes, King um, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and all these kings that are listed in the scriptures and we just have to look at it from a standpoint of what was going on in the world at the same time of what was going on in the Bible okay now that should I hope give us uh, encouragement that the Bible is not just some made-up story that we have to believe blindly but that that God was has has allowed these things to continue to to exist to just validate and solidify your faith so when you dig into the scriptures, you gotta, you've got to find some of this stuff so that you can understand, like, what was it really like for Daniel when he was there? So remember um, that when we, when we study these things and we look at this idea that, that the gods were being worshipped through man as the pharaoh or the king in power, that's really important for us as we study the book of Daniel. Because Daniel really identifies this idea of worshipping man as God. All right? And it helps us understand the complexities of the stories that Daniel's about to share, whether it's about him and his prayer time or Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego or any of the other stories that we hear in there. It all has to do with this idea that, God, uh, that the gods were manifesting themselves through the pharaohs and the kings. And it starts off uh, in the very first chapter of Daniel. And so um, to spare you the boring history, all right, I get pretty excited about history and, and it should come alive and it should make our minds explode with passion and power, but it doesn't. So that's okay. So we'll get into the message of Daniel um, and, and find out what was Daniel really trying to get across to us uh, 2,400 years ago, okay, 2,500 years ago, somewhere in there. Um, what was his message? There's four things I want you to remember when you, when you dig into the Word of God and you dig into Daniel. Remember these four things. And if you know Daniel, uh, just check me on these. But his main message is remember the Lord your God always. No matter what happens to you guys, no matter what you go through, remember the Lord your God always. And we're going to be able to see if that's a repeated theme throughout the book of Daniel, all right, to his people. And then he also points out in here uh, that punishment awaits the wicked, all right? We're going to see if that's a continued theme throughout the book of Daniel, all right? And then we've got victory awaits the faithful, all right? We're going to see if Daniel predicts that there's victory coming for those. And then I wonder if Daniel models faithfully wait for the fulfillment, okay? And so remember, those are the four phrases that Daniel's message, that's the message of what Daniel's getting across to his people, and quite frankly, it really translates to our day and age as well, all right? So, so let's just read Daniel 1. I don't have time to go through all of Daniel, but we're going to start with Daniel 1, and then we'll work our way through it and see if, um, see if this stays true to these four themes in the message, all right? So Daniel 1.1. 1, 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So what we fe- oh, go back. So what we see on there is that there, we have a king. We have two kings, Jehoiakim and King Nebuchadnezzar. Do we have any record of those outside of the Bible? Absolutely. Can we figure out what happened? Yes, he besieged it. What's besieged it means? That means that he killed off all these people sitting up here in the front, the royal court. He killed them off. Why? Because that's what you do when you besiege a kingdom. You take them captive. You get rid of the people that were in charge. Why? Well, because they are your threat. All right, the common people weren't the threat. It was the people in charge, the authorities, the kings of the other nations. They would make them subservient. If they didn't kill them, they would make them slaves. All right, so it was definitely not a good day. So keep going. It says, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now that's really important. Daniel does not mince words. We're two, we're two verses in, and Daniel's already identifying his first theme. Remember, remember the Lord your God always. Okay, culture says, Nebuchadnezzar's God was more powerful than God, right? Daniel's saying, no, Nebuchadnezzar didn't win. God delivered us into his hand. God's still in control. He just delivered him. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't win. God gave us over to Nebuchadnezzar. You see the difference? Big difference. And that was, he didn't, he didn't have to spend time on this because this, the Hebrew people got it. They totally understood what Daniel was saying. He didn't have to explain culture to them at that point in time. Along with some, and so the king of Judah into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar, he carried off the temple, he carried them off to his temple, his God in Babylonia, and put the treasures in the house of his God. Now, why is that important? 
Because when you take the artifacts of your, your country that you just captured and you put the, the relics of their God into your temple, then that's literally making them subservient to your gods. It's all spiritual symbolism. And so King Nebuchadnezzar was showing the Israelites, hey guys, my God's bigger, my God's stronger, my God's more powerful. And Daniel is reminding them, hey guys, even though this happened, God delivered us, Nebuchadnezzar did not win. So God's reminding the people, hey guys, no matter what happens, don't forsake the Lord your God. Keep going. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials. Now, different translations read that differently, but the word there actually means chief of the court eunuchs, okay? And that's important to remember. Okay, if you don't know what a eunuch is, look it up. But the chief court's coming after Daniel and his buddies, all right? So the chief eunuch is, all right? To bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. So Daniel represents, he was probably between 10 and 15 years old, to a young man, teenager, being captured, watching his country being, and, and his family members being destroyed because he was young. He would have been viewed as being a potential slave in the kingdom, and so they're going to capture them and take them into the king's court service. What we know about the culture of the day is that the, when you served in the king's court, especially in the Babylonian and Persian Empire, you were turned into a eunuch. Why? Because they didn't want you sleeping with their people, making babies in your nationality. They just wanted you to serve them. And, and we have to ask ourselves, do we have any record or evidence that shows that this might possibly be happening? So I believe the picture's the next one, right? Yeah. So you can't totally see it, but the first guy in the front here has a beard, and the rest of the guys are all clean shaven. This is all historical evidence. We see this all on all the artifacts that we find. Um, the king's servants, the king's quarters, they were always eunuchs. Why? Because he was the only one that could procreate and, and make, uh, make babies, so to speak, uh, in his kingdom. He didn't want anybody else, but he wanted the wisdom and they wanted the power that all these other nobilities brought. And so he captured these young men and emasculated them and turned them into eunuchs to serve in his kingdom's court. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a bad day. That's a rough day, guys. All right, so, so here comes King Nebuchadnezzar turning these guys into his servants. He set the chief eunuch against and said, go grab the, the smart kids and bring them to me. That's what I'm wishing. I was dumb. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be noble. I'm out, guys. I'm out. Just, just you go. All right. So, but Daniel and his buddies got taken. Okay. So flip to the next scripture. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. So not only was their, their nation taken away, their heritage taken away, their family killed off, taken into captivity, emasculated. Now they're being indoctrinated with the Babylonian culture. All right? This is a rough day. These are some rough things that are happening to this young Daniel and his buddies. Okay, Keep going. But it wasn't just them. It said young men. They took the whole court of them. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. Three years they had to be indoctrinated with the Babylonian culture. After that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Now we think that Daniel was either uh, in line to be king or he was, he was some ranking official. He had some nobility. Um, and we think that he was probably the most ranking official or next in line, not official because he was a teenager, uh, but he always was the one that was speaking. So he either just stood out above the rest of them all or he actually was the one that was either the oldest or he had the most uh, heritage from those that were captured. So uh, we think that he was uh, from the tribe of Judah, but he may have just been from the city of Judah, but it was from the southern kingdom. If you don't know the southern kingdom, uh, the north and the south of Israel had already divided by then. The southern kingdom was all that was left. The southern kingdom was made up of the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. If you know anything about history and, and Jesus, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. So Daniel was most likely in some form of the lineage of Christ himself, right? He may have been a prince, he may not have been, but he was still within the nobility and he understood and he had been trained in the courts of Israel and he had, he had been one of the ones that had received a full education, all right? So keep going. And those were his three buddies, which will soon be named differently. So the chief official of the eunuchs gave them new names. All right? So now they don't even have anything. Now their names are being changed. Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, not Belshazzar. Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's son. Belteshazzar was Daniel. To Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Keep going. 
But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission to not defile himself in this way. So from the very beginning, remember, we remember the four passages, the four phrases, remember the Lord your God always, no matter what happens to you, never give up on God. All right? So Daniel understood bad days. And so from the very beginning, he's like, guys, I'm not, I'm not even going to defile myself. So he asked the chief official, hey, I don't, even, I don't want the food the king's given me. Give me something different. All right, so keep going. He says, I'm not going to do this. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of the Lord my God and the king, or afraid of my Lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Now here's what I, I want you to imagine this for a second. Imagine you're Daniel and the buddies and all the rest of your guys that were taken with you to, to serve the king. And, and, and imagine the peer pressure in this moment, all right? So you're sitting there, and, the, and the, the court official comes in. And you've already had all these things done to you, okay? You've watched everybody die. You've had things done to you that you wish hadn't been done. You've been taken captive. You're serving in the king's palace. And now they're forcing food down your throat, giving you a new name. And now Daniel's like, nope. I'm not eating that food. And the guy's got to be looking at him like, seriously, now you're going to stand up for yourself? You're going to make a deal out of the food? Dude, shut your face. Man, just eat the food. Stop. Leave us alone. Go die on your own. All right? So imagine yourself. You got to picture yourself in this moment. Food? That's the least of my concerns. But Daniel was like, I'm not going to, I don't care about all this stuff that happened to me. I'm not going to continue to defile myself with something that I can control. All this other stuff I can't control, but I can control what I do and what I eat. And he says, I'm not going to do it. And the, and the court official was like, um, yeah, well, now my life is on the line and I'm not into this whole God thing with you. All right. So Daniel goes on. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? Because there were more than him. The king would then have my head because of you. And I'm not into that, Daniel. Keep going. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. This is, if you know anything about the Daniel fast, this is where it comes from. Uh, Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Just 10 days. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. So Daniel, even though in captivity, he's already standing up to authorities. He's, refl- he's, re- he's doing it in a respectful way, but he's reflecting the authority that God has given to him as, as a king, as royalty, as, as nobility. All right? So he knows how to communicate. So this young man has, has been given a great power by God in this moment. So go ahead, see what happens. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men of the royal food, that ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Exceedingly important as Daniel sets up. This is Daniel 1. Folks, we aren't even to Daniel 2. And Daniel's setting up, he's reminding of the Hebrews of everything that's going to transpire in the, rest of, in the rest of this book of Daniel, all right? Keep going. At the end of the time set, the end of the three years, so now three years has transpired, Daniel's reminding them of what's going on by the, set by the king to bring them into his service. The chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. He's like, here you go, Nebi, take them, all right? So Nebuchadnezzar talks to him. The king talked with them, and he found none of them, no one else equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Now notice in chapter 1, he calls them by their right names. Later in the chapters, they call them by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because the audience changed. He's talking to Hebrews here, right? So just interesting little tidbits when you read that. But from that moment on, King Nebuchadnezzar knew these guys, right? And so when you read the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it's a big deal because... King Nebuchadnezzar can't have his court officials not bowing down to him as king, all right? So that's why he got so livid. And if you wonder, like, where was Daniel in that moment? Because that was always a question that people ask. Read the few verses leading up to it. It kind of explains where Daniel was. So let's keep going. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better, ten times better than his own people. That made Daniel really popular with people, all right? So 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Now remember, 
Everybody believed in God and gods and, and spirits and all that kind of stuff. So it's consistent with all the culture of everything that we know. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, what, what just happened there, and you're totally unaware of it, he went from, uh, he just jumped to being 90 years old. He went from a teenager to 90 years old in less than one verse. He was a captive until he was 90 years old and died. He went through four different kings, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. All right? He went from a Babylonian captivity to a Persian captivity. What a lucky guy he was, right? One captive nation to another, watched his friends die, even as a, even as a, uh, a, a guard, or not a guard in charge, but someone that's in charge of a lot in the nation. He still couldn't protect his people from the atrocities of other nations coming in and attacking them. And so when you, think about, when you think about what Daniel's messages were with the whole, remember the Lord your God always, we'll start with that one. How do, we, how do we translate that into our lives today? Daniel knew, Daniel understood difficulties. Daniel knew what it was like when you're having a bad day. Daniel understood what it was like when things weren't quite going right. So when he tells us, remember the Lord your God always, no matter what's happening to you, I think he has the authority to speak with some with some passion here. He, and he's reminding the Hebrews, hey guys, no matter what, no matter what happens to you, don't forget the Lord your God always. And, and this, is, this is really something that I find difficult in America because we get pretty high up on ourselves on t- at times. And we think that we're kind of the ones that the, the New Testament scriptures revolve around and, and apocalyptic literature. And, and when our nation kind of goes down or something bad happens to us, we think all of a sudden you'll hear all the Christians saying, well, the Lord's coming soon. Really? I don't read anything about America in the Bible, folks. All right, so we just might want to check ourselves. This history thing's been going on a long time without us. It's going to go on a long time without us again. All right, just, and, and I don't want to depress you here, but I just want to give us a little bit of context in, in the Word of God. All right? um, I don't know if you've checked the maps lately, but we are living in a time in a world where there's about 7 billion people in this world, and you're one of them. Okay, just give, give ourselves a flat line here, all right? And the other really depressing news is you're going to die, okay? At some point in time, it's all going to come to an end, and what you did with that life needs to be based upon these four principles. No matter what happens in that life, are you going to remember what Daniel remembered? Because life doesn't revolve around America. The world does not revolve around America. History and, a, and the future does not revolve around America, We've got to remember that when we're studying the scriptures. And I find it fascinating that Americans have a really hard time with that. We try to interpret everything from what's going on in America versus what's happening historically and in the future. So just keep, keep our position in mind when you try to force American heritage upon God in the way that he interprets or wrote the scriptures. So now with that being said, how do we apply that in our day and age? You came in here today with something. Right? I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know something's going on, all right? Because that's life. So in that moment, remember God. And remember that the other thing that happens when those things are happening, okay? Especially with the, the tragedies that we've recently had in our news, all right? Punishment awaits the wicked. Okay, Daniel was very clear about that. God has this. And so many times we forget and we think that, and, and we want justice now, and God is infinitely patient and that's what messes up our world. Because, because of God's patience, we've got to remember the fact that if it weren't for God's patience, you and I would not have been able to wake up this morning. Hear me on that. You see, the Old Testament reflects the righteousness and the holiness of God. And, and many times think, of, well, he's just judgmental. No, it reflects how pure he is. He cannot exist in a wicked world. And so the Old Testament proves why we need Jesus. It shows the reasoning why. And so if God weren't patient, there isn't a single one of us alive that would stand a chance. And so we, this, is, this should give us great, great peace. That song that we're talking about with peace, we should know punishment awaits the wicked and, a, and God's patient with it and give us joy because we know that we would have been in that punishment if it weren't for his patience. Man, that's good stuff. You should, you should get excited about that, but you aren't. So go on. Go to the next one. All right, keep going. Victory awaits the faithful. Now this part fascinates me because we get really impatient. When things aren't going our way, we take it back. God, Matt was talking about that last week. We do it my way, their way, or God's way. And when God's way is slow, we decide we want to be in charge. 
And we figure, well, then God must be wrong. Other countries' gods must be more powerful. Other countries' gods must be the right way. Other people's opinions must be right. God must be wrong. He's moving slowly. Daniel says, hey, remember, victory awaits the faithful. Now, I don't know about you, but Daniel was still a captive when he died. And, it, and every Hebrew would have known that. And he's like, hey, guys, don't forget, though. Be faithful. And then watch what he, the last message that Daniel gives to us. Faithfully wait for the fulfillment. Someday, guys, some days we, someday we get to stand in front of God. And if you have Jesus as your Savior, you get to join him for eternity. And this little thing we call life, this little blip on the radar, all the hurt, all the pain, all the tragedy, all the atrocities, they're going to be gone. This is the worst life we'll ever get with Christ in our life. And Daniel's message is, guys, wait for the fulfillment of God, even if it takes an eternity. During that time, remain faithful. Don't forget the Lord your God. Even when the trials get hard, don't forget the Lord your God. Even when life is not treating you well, don't forget the Lord your God. Even when you're being thrown into the furnace and the fires of life, don't forget the Lord your God. Even when people are betraying you and, and trying to kill you, don't forget the Lord your God. And Daniel predicted some horrible things that were going to happen in the future. And he reminded them, even when these horrible things happen, don't forget the Lord your God. So today, my friends... I just challenge you. I don't know what's going on in your life, but God does. And he's just calling out to you and he's saying, I want to be there with you. Let me walk with you through it so that you will have the strength and the integrity of Daniel so that you do not forget my ways in the world in which you live. Let's pray. God, you're an awesome God. And Lord, I just come before you right now, Lord, and I, I know that the power of your Spirit is talking to people right now. I don't know what you're saying, but I'm going to trust that you are, and you do, and they know exactly who they are and what you're saying. So God, wherever they're at in their walk with you, I pray, God, that you'll give them the strength to endure, that you'll give them the, the ears to listen and hear and receive maybe the challenge that you've given to them, and God, that we would all be able to walk in integrity, that we would be able to walk in the example of godliness that Daniel did even in the midst of a world that is kind of chaotic and a world that is not reflective of, of your values. And yet, Lord, Daniel had to face all that. May we face it with the same faith, with the same love, with the same passion, with the same integrity and the same resolve. Lord, when we are weak, make us strong. When we're faithless, increase our faith. When we're hurt, comfort us. When we're rebellious, chastise us. But God, may we walk in obedience to you and with you. Lord, may our lives be a reflection of the incredible love that you have for your people, which is all of your creation. God, we love you and we thank you. We humbly serve you. In your name we pray, amen.